It's, tonight is uh, wisdom in our uh, progression of sweet spirit, wisdom, and power. <clears throat> and believe it or not, we finished chapter 13. So we're going to start out with chapter 14, Proverbs chapter 14. And we start out uh, with something that I... Well, let's, we'll read verse 1, and then we'll get into where, where we're going. Every wise woman buildeth her house, but the foolish plucketh it down with her hands. So it's very important to see the context first and make, the, and make, make it the subject to any applications that we may have afterwards. So if you go back to chapter 10, we see uh, a, there's a division in Proverbs. This is the third division. It just starts there. And it basically is a contrast of wickedness and evil against righteousness and good. And chapter 10 all the way through chapter 19 is the same subject. It's all the same. They're contrasts. Back and forth, back and forth. Sometimes they, they only deal with one part of it. <clears throat> Most of the time they go back and forth. So you have to consider the context first before you do anything else. Now, the word woman, every wise woman built at her house, is used approximately, if I remember correct, 25 times in the book of Proverbs. All but six of them are negative. I mean, it's incredible. You wouldn't, you wouldn't think that that's the way it is. So I, I want you to know, I want all of us to know what we're up against. And if necessity alerts you to historical views and prejudices concerning women. So... Get ready to get a little angry here. <laughs> Rabbinical li literature is filled with contempt for women. They were not to be, they were not to be recognized on the street uh, by acknowledging their presence, nor were you to speak to them. You were to treat them like they really were not there. They were not allowed to be instructed in the law they were not to receive an inheritance. They initiated, well, the, they were to walk six paces behind their husbands. That was the gross institution of social distancing. You will see that in Islam a lot of times. You'll, you'll see a family out there and the man and his kids are up there, and the woman's trailing somewhere behind. And you know what form of Islam they're from. If she uncovered her hair in public, she was considered to be a harlot. They were considered to be inferior to the man, and thus they were subjected to them in everything. The Jewish culture was the most male-dominated culture of the world at that particular time, and women were regarded as property, nothing more. Uh, and, and of course, what rights they had were very limited. In the home was the only rights a woman had, and again, based on the time, they were severely limited. A woman was passed from the control of her father and passed on to her husband's control with little to say of the matter. Now, the Mishnah taught that a woman was like unto a Gentile slave who could be obtained by sex, money, or judge. And in the religious services, they were not considered uh, members at all. They couldn't take part. They could watch. If you remember, even in, in the temple, there was the court of the women, and they could sit and they could watch, but they couldn't participate. 
They never read from the Torah, nor were they required to come to any feasts or festivals. Women received only the bare minimum of education and that from their husbands. And in court, their testimony was always suspect and you needed many more witnesses than a man, which almost made it impossible to believe anything they came to court about. If they were not married, they could not leave the home without their father's permission. If they were married, they could not leave the home without their husband's permission. Sharia law, of, of course, is Islam, is closely akin to the view and treatment of women historically here in the Old Testament. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw a question in here. Does it surprise you that in the book of Proverbs, it is the woman who is whorish, strange, clamorous, contentious, angry, and brawling, without one particular responsibility, responsibility geared toward the man? When you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, all of that begins to, to change. If you remember, he, he was surrounded by women. They were friends. He was friends with them. And, and that drove, among other things, that drove the Sadducees and Pharisees crazy because they were considered nothing, nothing. And he, he elevated them to the status, of course, moving forward to what we have today. And sadly, there are professing believers that still hold to the Old Testament and ancient views regarding women today. I've seen them. I've heard of them. I've watched them. And it's sickening that they could hold that kind of a view on women. So, in verse 1, and what's the contrast? Righteousness and wickedness. Good, evil. Every wise woman <clears throat> buildeth her house, but the foolish plucketh it down with her hands. So, understand, the woman mentioned in chapter 14 had to have a phenomenal amount of strength and faith based on the limitations she had. Much more than your average day woman today. And so, despite those limitations, <clears throat> I want to move beyond that to some underlying truths. Wise women build their houses. Very little is said about women in the northern ten tribes concerning the kings. Uh, you just don't hear anything other than 1 Kings 11.26, Jeroboam's mother was a widow. And in um, 1 Kings 16, uh, Ahab was under the thumb of his wife Jezebel, uh, the evil woman, of course, who he married. When you come to the tribe of Judah, and you, you take the, the kings that are mentioned there, most of the times the mothers are emphasized in some capacity or another, but without any discernible pattern of behavior. It's not like all the ones in the north turned out evil children and all the ones in the, in the south turned out wonderful children. So this wise woman, by counsel and I think example, led her household, which implies there could have been servants, there could have been children in the right way, directing their steps in accordance with what she knew of God's word. Her household thus, thus was established on the immo immovable foundation of righteousness. If, if our homes are not established that way, we're, we're toast. We're, we're gone. And believe it or not, we're pretty much gone. You can go to your average congregation, you hear nothing about how important it is in the home 
to establish it on righteousness because there's, there's a flaw somewhere. There's a failure somewhere and then it's never spoken about. So uh, as, you, as you would read about the, the uh, history of the, of the kings of Judah, a good king may have an evil son. And then later on you come and you see an evil king may have a good son. Again, there's no discernible pattern. What's true that train up a child in the way she'll go and when he's old he shall not depart from it. But there's also personal responsibility and accountability. Here, I, I believe Adam and Eve taught Cain and Abel the same way, the same instructions. One turned out rotten, the other one turned out good. The rotten one killed the good one. Same instructions. So, you know, did they not train them upright? I think they trained them upright, but you've got a will. This is the crazy part about Calvinism. It says you don't have a will. Of course you have a will. So the contrast is the foolish, the foolish woman. By the way, could it, could it also be a child in that home? Could it also be a servant in that home? It's possible, but I think it's dealing with the woman. Through her evil behavior and un unworthy instruction, lays up sorrow for herself and her offspring, grief for her offspring by her unholy influence. Let me give you an example. Second Chronicles chapter 22. Second Chronicles chapter 22. And we'll read here, starting in verse 1. <clears throat> and the inhabitants of Jerusalem made a Haziah, his youngest son, king in his, sta in his sta stead. For the band of men that came with the Arabians to the camp had slain all the eldest. So Haziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, reigned 42 <clears throat> years old was a Ahaziah, when he began to reign, and he reigned one year in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Athaliah, the daughter of Omri. He also walked in the, in the ways of the house of Ahab, for his mother was his counselor to do wicked, wickedly. Wherefore, he did evil in the sight of the Lord like the house of Ahab, for they were his counselors after the death of his father to his destruction. So there's a situation where the foolish woman tears down the home, tears down the house. Not only, not only that, but turns her son to do evil. The personal sins destroyed those homes. It destroyed those houses. And, and I'm going to inject this as well. So did, so did personal sins for the men. Many of the, the king's sins did the same thing. So the, the subject here we're, we're dealing with is the woman. So every wise woman buildeth her house. Why does she establish it on? Righteousness. It's rooted and established on righteousness. But the foolish pluck it down with their hands. They don't want that. They want their way, whatever that way may be. Verse 2, he that walketh in his, in his uprightness feareth the Lord, <clears throat> but he that is perverse in his ways despiseth him. Now, with rare exception, and I think of the thief on the cross when I'm saying this, it is the life that affirms whether somebody is really walking with the Lord or not. It's the life you live. So that's your words alone. The testimony of those words, if contradicted by your behavior, is worth very little. Paul in, in the book of Romans and James in the book of James seem to be at odds with each other. And it was thought that James was trying to teach salvation by, by faith plus works. But he wasn't. 
And Paul, Paul, of course, was teaching salvation by grace through faith. And so the, the argument is James was after, he was after the, the works part of it. Well, if you read the whole book, saving faith is evidenced by what? Can you see, by the way, can you see my faith? No. What do you see? The only thing you can see is what manifests itself from what I profess to be. And it would, would be behavior. And if the behavior contradicts what I say I am, it's not worth much. And that's what James was saying. You know, show me, show me your works by, by what you claim to be. Show me that you're, you're genuine. The Lord who, the one who actually fears the Lord will be ca characterized by godliness and faithfulness. <clears throat> and I know the old nature plays a part in this to get us off track, but <clears throat> surely we would only get back to where we were before we went off track, wouldn't we? Would you, would you just say, oh, I can't get back. I can't make it back. Of course you could. The Holy Spirit wants you back. So if the ways, if the ways are perverse and opposed to the Lord's will, his revealed will, isn't it true that there would be a great amount of disrespect and, and really no fear? As a matter of fact, I think the verse talks about uh, despising. Disrespect and despising the way of truth because you're not you're not you're, there's no fear so what are we saying <clears throat> God wants reality from you not the form hold your place here go to 2 Timothy 3 2 Timothy chapter 3 We read in verse 1, this know also, that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Well, they're here, aren't they? I hope you're not looking for something that's, that hasn't happened here. Because it all, it's all here. And there's a list of 19 things. These are 19 things that not of people that never set foot in a church. But these are 19 things that people who profess to be something, some kind of religious uh, something or another. And so after the list, verse 5 says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. God, God's not interested in the form. He wants the real thing. If we talk of reverence and fear of the Lord and respect while manifesting selfishness and uh, carnality, it's just sheer hypocrisy. And if you're saved, the old nature is running the show. That was Saul's problem. And he was told by, by Samuel to go after the Amalekites, destroy them, destroy everything about them, all their cattle, everything. And so what did he do? He decided, uh, well, look at these. These are, these are good cattle. This is good. You know, we should keep those for ourselves. It's like... Uh, <clears throat> If, if uh, a lot of those book burnings of old, when people would get these books and throw them into the fire, I ran across a guy who said, wait a minute, we could have a, we could have a garage sale and make a fortune off of these. Uh, no, you burn them, you get rid of them. Um, and so Saul wanted to do that. And then so, then he intruded into the office of the priest and, and of course, Saul had nothing, nothing good to say about him because he said to obey is better than sacrifice. Obedience is the key here. Whatever the word says, we should, we should obey it. 
So this is, this is important here for us in our day. <clears throat> Verse 3. In the mouth of the foolish is a rod of pride, but the lips of the wise shall preserve them. So the fool out of his own mouth, with vain boasting, really condemns himself. But the, the, word of the words of the wise declare the state of his heart, just as the fool declares his heart. The wise will give a soft answer to turn away wrath. The wise will be slow to speak and swift to hear. Their conversation manifests the wisdom that is in them and should be in us. We who are saved, it's important. Okay, verse four. This is a, be another little rabbit trail of sorts. Where no oxen are, the crib is clean, but much increases by the strength of the ox. Now, normally I don't, I don't go this direction. I may check things and I just keep going on. Uh, I, I really don't get into the co commentaries very much, but I checked one that was written in 1995. That is really rare. I like to go back before 1900. Uh, there's so much that goes on today that is, that is it, it's just not worth reading. All right, the writer just happens to be a Southern Baptist. And I'm quoting this. This is how he looked at verse four. We can easily apply this proverb to our century. The battle lines are drawn between environmentalists and industrialists and the consumers are caught in the middle, unquote. What just happened here? Well, we just, we just departed spiritual truth into political battlefield. What did, what, did, what did that have to do with what he said? And he gave statistics and he went on and on. And I mean, they were staggering, these statistics that he, that he had uh, to the issues of, you know, the detriments to the air and the waste and so forth and so on. But I don't think that was in the mind of Solomon as the Holy Spirit inspired him to write that. I think, what, I think what's worse is that the, the commentator uh, got, in, got into and, and got sucked down the toilet of both politics and environmentalism. And you don't win those arguments. And what's the sake of doing that anyway? We're not here to clean up the earth and clean up the environment. We're here to see souls saved and bring glory to God. We're here to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. He'll take care of the earth. And what's he gonna do with it anyway? It's gonna burn it up. So Solomon states, in contrasting righteousness and wickedness, where there are no oxen in the stall, in the crib. The crib is clean. And if that's your goal, Nothing more needs to be done. So go back in your house, sit down, uh, relax. And today, and, and now we go put it to today and depend on father government to enable you. Because you want, you want the crib to be clean. You don't want it to be messed up. You don't want to work the field and be able to grow the crops. Much increase results from the strength of the ox. Work, four letter word, work. You work. Some churches still have bus ministries. They're a lot of work. It costs a lot of money. You have to pay a lot of insurance. It gets dirty on the buses. And a lot of times bus kids get to church dirty gets a little noisy and sometimes loud. And people aren't used to that begin to complain. Look what they've done to our church. Look what they're doing to all this. Look how, it, oh, this is, this is so, 
so bad. A few times even with vacation Bible school. Uh, sometimes even with when we go out on, on uh, visitation, I've gotten calls here at the, at the church uh, several times. They're grumbling, they're complaining, they're whining, they're irritated, they're sour. And I'm the best person to answer the phone because I turn that all around. They are doing exactly what they've been told to do. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. They're obeying God. If somebody doesn't like that, the issue is between them and God, not us. So what's the alternative? Well, the alternative is keep the status quo. Do nothing, and it'll be cleaner. This is, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. The strength of the ox, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, adds wealth to the farm and makes it well worth all the time spent in cleaning the stall or the crib. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And you look here in, in verse, where are we? Verse 9. For it is written in the, in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Does God take care for oxen? Absolutely. So let me switch gears again. Don't you find it sad to hear comments railed against nonconformist saints, troublesome saints of God, and the efforts to try to root them out, get rid of them, as though they have no place here. And in the process, by doing that, you cut off much increase in blessing, which might ensue if grace and patience had been exercised. There, there are two ways you can address every situation. You can be irritated and think that we're not supposed to be irritated. We didn't come here to get irritated. And so therefore we need to cut out the irritation or you can just move on. And, and understand this is a normal part of life. When you, when you brought home a child from the hospital, do you think it might have been noisy? Or did he raise his hand or her hand and said, I need milk. I need to be changed. No, it was noisy. It was irritating. It, 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 it was lack of sleep. Why did you do that? Because you loved the baby. He loves the child. Well, who are we to not love each other? What's going on here? I mean, I thought we needed each other. The Bible says, and we need the effectual working of every part. If I'm a foot, you need me. If you're a hand, I need you. We all work together. It, it, has to, it has to be like that. I believe a lot of this has to do with the force of the church growth movement. To get rid of, according to the 40 days of purpose-driven life, get rid of the quote-unquote pillars of the church because they're holding things up. And you would think, that's good, we, you know, people that are sound in the faith are holding, holding it up. No, the writer meant holding up for becoming progressive and contemporary and everything associated with that. So get rid of them. So I say to, I say thank you, Rick Warren, for making it near impossible for my 85-year-old aunt, many years ago, uh, to make it almost impossible for her to get to the designated traditional service very early in the morning when she had no vehicle. 
And then the raunchy, anything goes service was the traditional time of when it used to be. Where the oxen, where no oxen are, if there's nothing going on, everything's clean. Everything's calm. There's no issues. There's no, no distractions. But much increases by the strength of the ox. So now, we don't we don't try to make sure that we are dirty and loud and boisterous. I think everything should be done decently and in an order. But people are people. And we just have to deal with it. And and deal it with it in wisdom. And I think in, you take verse 3 with verse 4, uh, the lips of the wise shall preserve them, and you don't get irritated. You can't get irritated. I, I've, been, I've gone home, I don't know how many times over these, these, these decades that I've been here, and said, you know what? I'm out of here. <laughs> I, I, I can't do this. And then I sit down and I talk it over with the Lord and I just keep going. You know, you don't, and you probably go home and say, I, I'm not going back there if that preacher keeps, up, keeps it up. I, I just can't. And that's okay. You've stuck with it. I don't understand that, but you've stuck with it. All right, verse 5. A faithful witness will not lie. But a false witness will utter lies. That's self-explanatory. It, does it mean that a faithful witness never would tell a lie? Not, I think, the, I think the, it's intentional to deceive, to mislead. But the false witness, he just cannot tell the truth. We dealt with an attorney years ago that made this statement. In court, the best liar wins. And how well I saw that a few years ago. The best liars won. They were not all just normal people. They were professional people. And it was just easy as peasy. It just came right out of them. And they knew that they were fabricating the truth. And even today, it's the same thing. Be careful here. A faithful witness is going to tell the truth. False witnesses, they're not going to tell the truth. Now, you see, in government, uh, to me, politics is the science of lying. These people lie. They, they are, they're going to tell you, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. And they do exactly the opposite, depending on, on what somebody may blackmail them over in government. I don't believe, you know, some people think we, we, can, we can turn the country around. We can get righteous people into government. Righteous people into government, I would just as soon take them back in the pond and tell them to clean up the pond by jumping in. Because it's not going to happen. They're going to get filthy dirty by being in the pond. Washington has corrupted and corrupted and corrupted. It's very difficult to stay true to the word and to the Lord. It is a corrupt place. Government was never set up uh, with us to be in it. And remember back... When, uh, when Israel wanted a king and Samuel said that he was disgusted with the people and he said, well, they don't know what they're asking for, but tell them this. And he gave a list of things. These, this is what's going to happen with you and your children and your people and your farms and your cattle. And, your, and, and they said, okay, we want to be like them. 
and they've regretted it ever since. So stick to the word all the time. Got great, great verses here. Uh, and praise the Lord for the Lord coming on the scene. Uh, I, I just can't imagine us here in the New Testament day having any part of Sharia law. And there are, there are Christians that, it, that I'm wondering if they're not closet Muslims because they, they treat everything uh, woman-wise, female-wise that way. It's sickening. So let's have a word of prayer. Uh, we can stay around. It's still light outside. Can you believe it? And uh, fellowship for a while. Father, thank you for your word. Your goodness to us. Your watch care over us. Our salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. The marvelous way in which you have come to this earth, lived a perfect life, showed us the value of, of, of all humanity, male and female, adults and children, and the compassion we should have on all of them, and showed us, even from the epistles later on after your resurrection, how we are to how we are to act, how we are to behave. And there is no, there is no caste system. We have a Christian system and it works. If we'll just allow ourselves to, to do it. So speak to our hearts as we go our way tonight and give us safety as we go to our homes and keep us uh, from any spiritual or physical harm. And let us use what we know, uh, maybe even what we've learned tonight, in a, in a really positive way. And we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen.